of you who aren't familiar with the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary, or PDE, we're an environmental nonprofit organization that was established in 1996. PDE is the host of the Delaware Estuary Program, one of 28 national estuary programs designated by Congress to promote America's estuaries. And our mission is to lead science-based and collaborative efforts to improve the tidal Delaware River and Bay. And while PD is hosting this webinar series, this is an event on behalf of the Urban Waters Federal Partnership at the Delaware River location. The goal of the Urban Waters Federal Partnership is to restore and reconnect communities, particularly those that are overburdened or economically distressed to waterways by improving coordination among federal agencies. And the Delaware River Urban Waters location encompasses four major urban areas, including Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Wilmington, Delaware, Camden, New Jersey, and Chester, Pennsylvania. Now we'd love to learn a little bit more about our audience today. So we'll be asking a couple of polling questions to get a feel for who's in the room before we get started. Um, and our first poll question today is which sector do you represent? And it looks like over half our participants are from the nonprofit sector, which is great. And we also have some educators, um, government, private sector, and other. Thanks, Leah, if you want to administer the second poll. And our second question today is, how did you hear about this webinar? PD social media post, web blast, PD website, employer, colleague, friend or family or other. All right, great. Looks like over half the participants heard about this from our email blast, as well as some from our so some social media posts, our website, and from employers or colleagues. Great, thanks. And we have one more poll for all of you today. And this last question is, where are you turning in, where are you tuning into for this webinar? All right, looks like almost everybody's from our region, Mid-Atlantic East Coast, and we have a few other people from Southeast Coast, as well as the Gulf Coast and other. Great, so thanks everyone for filling out these polls. So we have a great lineup of speakers this afternoon to share their work with youth engagement in Camden. We'll first be hearing from uh, Noel de Salsa with Urban Promise. Nuelda has a BS in environmental engineering from the Federal University of Paraiba, Brazil. She has been involved in different environmental projects from water quality monitoring to environmental awareness and education to watershed and stormwater management. Her goal is to promote uh, sustainable environments and she believes that the first step to, the, to that to happen is by raising awareness, especially among the youth, because they are compelling agents of change for current and future generations. As the Environmental Education Program Director at Urban Promise, she has the privilege to indulge in all of the above. In addition to hearing from Nuilda today, we'll also be hearing from one of the students participating in the program, Tanisha Torres, as well. We'll then be turning it over to Angela Wegner, who is the Executive VP and COO for the Center for Aquatic Sciences in Camden, New Jersey. Angela is passionate about lifelong learning, community well being, and the rights for all people to experience the wonders of nature. She has worked in the science and environmental education space for 29 years. She has served in many roles at the aquarium, but has found the most joy in working with communities of color, co-creating learning opportunities that resonates with their lived experiences, promotes authentic connection with nature, and supports social and environmental justice and self-advocacy. So with that, um, we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm going to turn it over to Noelda to kick us off today. So Noelda, whenever you're ready, you're welcome to share your screen. All right, good That's afternoon, good. everyone. Uh, my name is Noelda Souza. Like Emily said, I'm the Environmental Education Program Director, and today we're gonna be talking about connecting youth to urban waterways. And I have a very special guest as well. I have Tanisha 
Torres, and she is a student employee here in our Office of Experiential Learning. All right, so we're part of Urban Promise. Um, Urban Promise is a nonprofit as well. Our mission has been to equip Camden children um, and young adults with skills for academic achievement, life management, and spiritual growth. And the office that I'm part of is one of the main, one of the, sorry, main, um, one of the uh, offices in Urban Promise, and it's called Office of Experiential Learning. Um, is also known as Urban Trackers, and we have different activities from boat building. You know, we, we take kids uh, in different trips um, here in Camden and also in some other spots in the US. And also we're part of the Riverways. So the Riverways is a coalition of nonprofit organizations engaged with the urban waterways of Philadelphia and Camden. And we leverage share resources to improve safe community access to our waterways and provide programming that inspires youth to be a catalyst for greater awareness, use, stewardship of vital and natural resources. And our vision is that when healthy waterways will connect, sorry, we envision a day when healthy waterways will connect uh, our communities. And the other presenter today is part of the Riverways. Um, and then she'll talk a little bit about that um, later. Yes, and so I would just like to share a little quote um, that captures the essence of my job. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. And I like this because most people, you know, when, especially when they are in the urban, um, in an urban environment, they don't actually uh, notice or perceive the, you know, the environment around them. And it's uh, the case here in Camden, I believe. A lot of people don't know, you know, the Cooper River, which is a river that runs through Camden. And, um, you know, our mission is to just, you know, teach and show people uh, these environments and these green spaces and uh, close to where they live. So our first program is the River Guides. Um, the River Guides has employed four to nine Camden youth each summer as Cooper River Guides. Um, so basically we hire these kids here at Urban Promise, we have a high school, and these all these years uh, that we since we started River Guides, which was in 2016, we hired kids from our school, and we trained them to be able to lead ecological and historical tours of the tidal Cooper River. Uh, we also teach them about watershed principles and about the Delaware River watershed. Um, something else that we also teach them is to how to perform water quality tests. Um, and also when, you know, we're taking them in paddles or when they're leading paddles, we try, you know, to keep in mind that this is, you know, uh, the, the Kupu River is a place that needs to be, you know, um, preserved. So sometimes we're going to find trash and it's one of our one of our, you know, uh, one of the things we do is to, you know, collect any trash we see. As you can see here in this picture, this is just like one boat was able to find like three, you know, plastic bottles and cans in a, in a beer can. So it's something that we try to uh, keep in mind. It's just, you know, we're here to make the, you know, the environments better. And normally, after the river guys are trained, they take them people from our community uh, in these uh, Cooper River uh, tours. And normally 300 people in the summer season participate in these paddles. Um, but because uh, of COVID this year, unfortunately we had to cancel this public paddles. Here we have some pictures from public paddles from previous years. 
Um, we also have the, this boat that you can see in the top corner that can carry about 20 people. And it's, it's just really nice. It's an opportunity for our community to experience, uh, you know, being on the water. So because of COVID this year, instead of doing this public paddles, we actually uh, took cameras, we brought microphones, and then the river guides filmed their paddle. So they added a, a mini documentary video. And we presented this video in different, um, in different uh, forums and different presentations so people would see and they could have you know a little bit of of an idea of how, what it feels like to pedal on the Cooper River. So actually I made a one minute video. I made a one minute video version of our paddle and I'm going to share it with you guys. So this is the Cooper River. The Cooper River in total is around 16 miles long. The headwaters are in Gibbsboro and empties into the Delaware River, which flows out to the Atlantic Ocean. The, the Cooper River is actually named after William Cooper, who acquired the land in 1682. Cooper River was heavily polluted, but it has come a long way. We will continue performing water quality assessments to make sure it offers exceptional ecological and recreational significance. Yes, yeah, so actually the whole video is about 13 minutes. And if you guys would like to uh, check this video out, I'll uh, try to send an email. Um, I'll send the, the link via email. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I believe that the River Guides program is special because it provides, you know, the kids and a unique experience, something that they normally would not do on their own. And, you know, it's just providing access to the Cam Camden community. And this is just a picture of us. Uh, on our last day. So moving forward, normally here in our office, we have, um, um, sorry, trips to the Pinelands, to Assateague Island, and to uh, many other locations that are further. But because of COVID this year, we actually started doing trekker mornings in which um, every day we take a different grade from our high school. And we just try to, you know, show them a little bit about show them, uh, you know, the Cooper River. Um, so on the first week we went canoeing. And then on the second week we went kayaking. Uh, we met every day at the Cooper River Yacht Club. Um, this way we have, you know, like a point place where we could store all the canoes and the kayaks. And then we would, you know, go from there in the different activities. In also in this uh, uh, in this uh, daily activities, uh, we had a little bit of reflection. We had team building activities, and then the main activity. Also, we went a week. Uh, we had a week of fishing and seining. And on the left, this picture. These are snail eggs, actually. And the kids had you know fishing poles. Um, they had this sort of butterfly nets, and they were just trying to you know, capture uh, something in the river. And then after that, we put, you know, all the animals that we found um, back in the lake. And I also just want to share a quick video of what we do when uh, we find a fish. 
So this is our 10th grade. Yeah, so it, something that they, you know, like to do is nowadays is TikTok and, you know, that's, a, you know, a, a way that I found that, you know, could keep them interested and, you know, it's nice for them to see themselves in those videos and then we post that to our social media. Um, also, we had a biking, biking week. We biked around um, the Cuckoo River Lake and I just... I, do, I love this picture in the middle because one of our students fell and then right away his colleague, you know, gave him a hand and to help him get up. So it just had been like an opportunity, an opportunity for the students to, you know, get together, know each other, um, become, you know, comfortable with each other, with their classmates, and also to, you know, discover a little bit about Camden Waterways. Um, and then the following week, we had a nature walk week. Uh, we went to Hopkins Pond Park, which is an affluent to the Cooper River. And on the first day, it was raining really hard. And it's something that I like to, you know, share is that, you know, they were happy even in the rain. Uh, this girl with the yellow Poncho is Tanisha. She's here with us today, and she's going to share in a little bit about, you know, her experience with trackers. And then, you know, you just, um, the kids want to feel like they're appreciated. So after that, it was so cold, and then we were all wet because of the rain. So we took them to a cafe, and then we bought them, we, yeah, we bought them uh, hot coffee or hot chocolate. Some of them even ordered, you know, like a chicken sandwich or something. So it's just important that for the kids to feel appreciated and that, you know, like they, that somebody cares, um, you know, to show them their own city and, yeah. Um, so before we go into that, I would just ask Tanisha uh, to share her experience with, with trackers, you know, this semester. Um, so you can turn on your camera and microphone. Okay, so I guess this semester was way more different than last year. Like last year, it started good. Like it's still good, but it's just in a different way because last year we had a lot of trips. Like we went to Maine, DC, um, where else? New York, and a lot, a lot of places, right? And then when we, I thought when the COVID started and we did this, like social distancing and these kind of morning trucker things. I thought it would be bad, but then it turned out it was actually really fun. We, uh, sorry for the background noise. Just, uh, sorry for that. But we did a lot of fun things, like, like things I wouldn't expect to do, like for like, let's just say the biking. Like I didn't really, like before that, I didn't really like biking because I was always scared I was going to fall and stuff like that. But then we took like this beautiful hike to the park where, where we had fun and enjoyed it. We also um, we also went kayaking and fun fact, I fell in the water where like it was in the shallow part too. I don't know how that happened, but I fell in. It was everything. Sorry, one moment. Sorry. Everything this semester has been so fun. Like, like, and we make it as safe as possible. They make it as so safe too. Even though not a lot of people been going because of the weather lately, like it's been raining a lot and it's been a little too cold, but we still make it work and it's still fun at the end. And I'm going to keep going because it's fun. Yeah, and I like to, you know, acknowledge and congratulate Tanisha because like she said, she fell in the water and even still she, 
you know, apply to be a student employee and she'll be working with, you know, underwater activities. So uh, that's very, very brave of her. And I would also like to thank that she, you know, agreed to talk today. Um, so one of the greatest challenges, Denisha already says, social distancing. Um, it's really hard to, uh, you know, we have to keep an eye that all the kids wear masks all the time. Um, for example, normally we would take kids, you know, transport them to, like Denisha said, Maine or DC, but because we cannot have them all in a bus, that's why we decided to do local activities. And, you know, just following all these protocols have, um, has um, uh, diminished all the spectrum of different activities that normally we would do. Um, also building relationships because I'm new to this job. I started in July, um, you know, in the beginning, you know, they would not see me still as a figure of, you know, like, oh, she's an adult and then she's responsible for, um, for us. So, you know, building relationships is something that I believe is really important because kids will listen to you better uh, if they know and trust you. And also staying inspired. Um, sometimes I would just run out of ideas and, you know, just there's so many limitations, like I said, and it's easy, you know, to lose inspiration. So just keep reading, researching to find new ideas, creating interesting lesson plans. You know, that has been a challenge for me because, you know, we always have to keep in mind those uh, COVID-19 guidelines. Yeah, and then some elements that worked. It was diversifying activities because uh, we were meeting every week. We tried to do something different, you know, every week, like canoeing, kayaking, you know, all in, all keeping in mind, you know, the Kuku River, but then, you know, doing something different every week so they wouldn't, you know, get bored as easily. Um, also, the social media engagement. Um, like I showed the TikTok video, you know, they like to do that kind of stuff, you know, videos, pictures. So I'm always, you know, trying to do that kind of stuff, you know, ask them to follow our page. This way they see themselves, you know, on the screen. And it has been a, a really cool, um, it's been a really cool thing to do with them. Also something that, you know, I thought that they were actually more comfortable. It was after we started bringing a bunch of snacks um, savory and sweet snacks, you know, before we used to bring mostly, um, um, trail mix or granola bars. And then they go, no, we want something savory. So we brought them, you know, a uh, little chip, uh, a few chips, chip bags and bagels and cream cheese. And uh, they really like that to start off their day, um, you know, eating and then feeling comfortable. It started getting cold in, in the last month. So we started to bring them um, hot chocolate, hot coffee. So these things, you know, actually, um, you know, make them feel, make, it makes them feel more comfortable. And also extra layers like gloves, hats, raincoats, and sneakers. This way, if there's, you know, they forget, or if there's, you know, it starts raining all of a sudden, you know, they, this way they are protected and then they're wearing the right gear. And also if doing any physical activity, we try to keep, you know, a balance between being too crazy and being too chill. Um, for example, in biking week, some kids still didn't know how to bike. So we separated the adults to, you know, stay on land, sorry, stay uh, in the yacht club, you know, trying to teach the kids that didn't know how to ride a bike, um, how to do that. Um, and then the other, uh, supervisors went with the other kids around the pond, the lake. So you just, you know, try to find a balance, see where all the kids stand. If they, you know, if they are more comfortable doing, you know, more, uh, doing more, you know, heavy exercise, you just, you know, keep that in mind. And also asking for feedback. Um, from week to week, there were little things that we would improve um this way you know if we we're doing something that they didn't like or that didn't work we could improve on the following week and also in my case uh it was also a challenge to try to disguise environmental lessons and fun activities um so for example 
on the week we went kayaking we just went to this little island in the lake and we did water quality tests or for example i brought the uh watershed model and then each one of them would decide if they wanted to be the farm polluter or the uh, factory and then we would do this watershed uh, demonstration and you know just try to disguise all that in just fun activities um, sometimes it's um sometimes it, that that I, that I would say is an obvious lesson but then sometimes just showing them the environments around them it's it's an environmental lesson because like he said in the quote they will protect what they know and just by showing them and you know exposing them to these environments they you know they start to i i believe that they, they they're not they're, they're they're gonna think oh no i don't want to destroy this place because it's really cool all right so that was our presentation i would like to thank everybody for being here and listening to me you can find us at Urban Trackers, and then this is my email if you want to contact me. And I'll just ask you to follow us on our Instagram or on our Facebook at Urban Trackers. All right, that was great. Thanks so much, Noelda. And thanks to Nisha for sharing your experiences. Uh, I love the idea of using TikTok to share work on environmental education and you know students helping with monitoring projects. That's great. So we do have just a couple of minutes to ask some questions. If folks want to type them into the Q&A box, I think we had a few come in already. So let's take a look. Um, one question for Noel does someone asked, have you ever done any work um, on the Newton Creek before? I grew up in Camden and played there quite a bit. Uh, not in Newton Creek. Um, I'm actually, I'm still, you know, getting familiar with the area because like I said, I'm from Brazil and I live in Philadelphia, but I'll keep that in mind. I, I wasn't, I didn't know that about the Newton Creek and then I'll definitely look into it. And it looks like, I know Joanne's on the phone too. Um, Joanne, did you want to answer that question? I saw that you indicated you wanted to answer it live. All right, maybe we can come to, back to that one in a couple minutes. Um, we had another question come in asking um, if you can post a link to your social media. I would love to post the TikTok video on the Delaware River Festival social media platforms. Yeah. Um, what is the best way for me to share a link? So you would be able to post it in the chat box or um, if you want to send me a link following the webinar today, we can put that in a um, in a follow up email so we can definitely get that out to folks who are on tuned in, tuned in on the webinar today. All right. Yeah, so I can do that. Great. And then one last question. Um, how many students are you able to engage a pre and post COVID? Is it one school or multiple schools that, you, that have partnerships? Um, yes, so normally we work with our Urban Promise Academy students, but also we have new student orientations uh, with the public school here in Camden. Um, besides that, our public paddles are open to anybody in Camden. All right, great. Thanks so much. Um, and with that, we can turn it over to Angela. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as uh, Emily said, I'm Angela Wenger from the Center for Aquatic Sciences um, at Adventure Aquarium. I'm glad to be here with you today. So I'm going to, you have to forgive me, I'm not, oops. Uh, do that. Oh, jump the gun. <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Looks good. 
All right, thank you. <laughs> the affirmation is helpful. <laughs> um, so uh, again, I'm Angie Wenger from the Center for Aquatic Sciences, and um, happy to be here with you today to talk about how we as a center engage youth um, in the um, the world of water. Uh, we also focus on a little bit uh, of land as well because um, they really kind of all go together. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the center and uh, primarily about our cause program and the, uh, this program is sort of the entryway into all of the other keystone things that keystone things that we do like river quest um, for youth and for community so um, who is the center um, and what do we do the center for aquatic sciences has uh, been in camden since uh, 1989 uh, we have sort of a, a long relationship uh, we were the primary organization um, put together to build the aquarium uh, in the city of camden as an economic anchor anchor but really what we do is um, we, we try to uh, create, co-create experiences and leadership opportunities in the environmental space um, with the hopes that this inspires and leads to stewardship of our land and water. And you know, in doing that, what we really stand for is uh, learning and justice and connecting um, everyone with nature in in a way that resonates with them. So uh, a lot of our programs are um, meant to be not just one offs, but uh, opportunities for lifelong learning. Um, and then not just uh, activities, but um, actions, we, we like to kind of marry um, learning with sort of the action part of that. Uh, and as a uh, as an organization that is uh, sort of steeped in Camden for many, many years, um, what's super important to us is this, the environmental and the social justice aspect of what we do, because everyone has the right to um, clean water and clean air and, um, you know, enjoying the, the land. The program that I wanted to bring to you today really is focused around youth. And it is, as I said, Keystone program to the center. Uh, it was created in um, 1993, uh, just a little bit after the facility opened to the public. And it's really important as, um, as an expression of our mission. And so CAUSE stands for Community and Urban Science Enrichment. And it has many components to it, which I will get into. So the cause program um, has these three primary components, all focused on youth. The first one is the um, the Explorers program. And this is really sort of the gateway program for middle school students um, to spend uh, in eighth grade an exploratory year with us as volunteers and we are um, engaging with them probably two to three times a week um, looking at different aspects of uh, aquatic science oceans rivers um, environmental science and uh, even exploring some of the outdoors in the the nature around them but also in in trips that we take here and there this is a year-round program um, and again, we spend a lot of time with, with these students. And we, we, we focus on middle school students because we know um, from research that uh, the middle school years are really the sort of critical pivotal time when students and particularly um, students of color and young girls sort of fall out of love with science for a multitude of reasons. They've just become disenfranchised with it. Um, so we wanna make sure that when we're um, doing programs with middle school students that we're, we're kind of maintaining that sort of joy and interest and inspiration. The next component are our interns. This is the high school component of the program. And um, we focus really really stringently on work, academic, and leadership opportunities for these students. 
um, we run it on a sort of cohort driven uh, model. So ninth grade students are um, involved in one aspect, 10th grade, uh, 11th grade and 12th grade, all different tracks um, so that there is sort of progressive um, growth and leadership and um, more in depth concentrated um, content that is going on with them. Um, so the first year students spend a lot of time, uh, almost the entire year, just in training. And they explore everything from um, classification to all different kinds of animals um, and habit and uh, looking at habitats to classroom management, um, how to how to write curriculum, um, learning how to handle certain animals. Um, exploring some field techniques and everything that they're going to need because um, at the end of that time, their role is really to be the public educator um, for the Center for Aquatic Sciences. So we spend a lot of time looking at careers, uh, supporting their educational, um, their educational goals, whether it be if they want to move on to higher education or out into the workforce. Um, and then of course, balancing that with the schoolwork that they do. Um, we encourage um, a really sort of uh, connection to nature. And we do spend a lot of time outdoors. You can see from these photos that that we, we get on vessels, we're doing uh, you know field techniques and science practices, um, water quality, um, a, a multitude of things. And then as they go up in their years, they take on more leadership responsibility in the program for their, for their peers in uh, younger cohorts. Um, Trailblazers, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is one of the tracks that these students can take on um, as they get a little bit further into the program. And uh, what I mean by tracks is they, as they grow into the program, they can express something that's more of interest to them. Trailblazers is one of those, uh, but they could also become part of the communications and social media team. They can become part of the interview team. They can become part of the community education team, which is a little bit more focused. And finally, all interns and even some explorers participate in, in Cause Camp, which is a five week summer program and the students uh, in explorers and interns, mostly interns, are, um, after they're trained, they spend a lot of time writing curriculum. So I talked about uh, one of those aspects of training was learning how to, to write uh, educational curriculum. Uh, they spend that time in the spring uh, looking for themes for a summer camp, um, creating uh, agendas and activities and trips, uh, all under the guidance of the staff. However, primarily the it, the responsibility is up to them to come up with a really engaging summer camp for students in in grades K to eight um, in the uh, in the city. Um, so. Um, it's a program that with all of these sort of interlocking pieces and it's meant to be progressive and, and cyclical if, um, in, in a way, maybe not cyclical, but uh, progressive where you were engaging at, in a very small scale um, students in K to eight through a summer, a summer camp experience, which is sort of entry. Um, we see eighth grade students who have been part of that camp um, continue to be interested as we recruit for the Explorer program. They move on into the high school program and they give back their role models and educators for the community going back. And then when they get into high school, I'm sorry, college, um, we even ask those folks to come back if they wanna to continue to work and they become uh, mentors to the students who are still in the program. Uh, the program has been uh, around for 27 years and counting. And so we've also seen for the center and, and quite a bit in the cause program that a lot of our full-time employees are actual um, past participants of the program. So the uh, the philosophy and uh, the framework of the program has remained uh, very much intact um, and the experience is fairly steady from year to year. So in these 27 years, um, we have had over 300 
teens uh, participate in the program, they've interacted with more than uh, 3,000, probably creeping up on 4,000 uh, younger students uh, in the community at this point. And we partner with um, 10 different high schools and every middle school. And 100% of the students who have been in the program have uh, graduated high school, which we're pretty proud of. 99% of them matriculate to higher education, although you know, our goal is not to um, have them necessarily pursue a higher education. Many of them do. Um, those who don't go right into the workforce, they are confident um, and ready to take that uh, that journey on, or they go into the military service, um, you know, delaying the workforce for a few years or education. Um, so, to the overall impacts that we've seen in these in these years, is that seventy five percent of the students, uh, although they may not come into the program with the intent of uh, being scientists or educators, um, many of them have found sort of their um, their affinity for these. And so our alum have been or are chemists and computer engineers, um, doctors, um, ocean engineers, marine biologists, forensic scientists, uh, and teachers of all stripes, uh, which we're super proud of. Um, one of the things that they talk about the most when they reflect on their time in the program is the confidence and the leadership that they gained in being part of the program, especially since they are educators um, to a larger public, they spend a lot of time communicating in, you know, in writing and verbally. And so their ability to, um, to cross uh, you know, multifaceted uh, groups of all sizes uh, gives them sort of an edge on, um, on most other students who are kind of coming out uh, and entering into college or the workforce. Um, another aspect, a very popular aspect of the program is the travel. We do a lot of travel uh, around the country, mostly to different kinds of aquatic environments to um, practice field, um, field science and uh, science practices, but also to get uh, a look up close of the different kinds of aquatic habitats that are out there um, and to reinforce the things that they're learning back at home. And time and again, the students really uh, appreciate the fact that they've been able to travel in this program. And um, what what rises to the top for them is the the sense that they have given back to the community in some way as becoming, you know, a, a messenger and a mentor to the younger students in their neighborhood. And they really take on that, that responsibility um, as a mentor. And it's something that that they enjoy the most, especially with the summer camp kids. Okay, I wanted to share just sort of a brief video, uh, if I can find it. Um, there it is. I'm going to, all right, this is just a one minute video and it really speaks to what the, sorry about that, what the students, um, great, we can see it, Angie. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> I just got to find the play button now. Sciences at Adventure Emporium. We're coming back from Capitol Hill. Today was a very good day because we actually had the opportunity to have a meeting with Congress, with the Office of Congressman Norcross, which is the congressman of our district. And one thing that I got out of today is that I got my voice heard. Hi, my name is Kimberly, and we also visited the office of Congressman Norcross. And what I got out of the um, what I got out of the meeting is that. We got to speak about our personal experiences throughout the program that we attend. Hi, my name is Cassette. We also had a meeting with Senator Booker's office. What I got out of today was that it's important to remind government officials that 
Hi, my name is Dimitri, and during our meeting with Congressman Pasquero, I learned that teamwork is very important. All of us together portrayed our importance of after school programs because they serve as these safe places where adults give support and also mentors to become better people in the future, and as well as give us a chance to give back to our community. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just get back to the main. All right. So there are a few links here, which I will share, um, but I didn't want to go through all of them because some of these are quite long. The students in the, um, the communications and social media team um, put together all kinds of videos. Uh, we have a video on the Student Summit, which is a, a video that um, was an opportunity for the students to present some of their research on horseshoe crabs um, at the center. Uh, through a NOAA um, program uh, a few years back. And uh, that's partly because we are a coastal ecosystem learning center, which, um, which just a few aquariums around the country are part of. Um, and I wanted to also share this, um, and we'll do that after this. Uh, this year, because of COVID, we couldn't have um, any of our in-person festivals. And one of those is World Oceans, uh, World Oceans Day. Um, because of the opportunity for doing virtual, we turned it into an entire week. And so our students put together some um, videos that were focused on uh, introducing different kinds of animals. Uh, so there are spider crabs out there, um, horseshoe crabs, and um, the Bangai cardinal fish. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at that. And then um, with so much uh, social justice and strife this year, um, they felt it was ex extremely important to also have their voice heard um, by creating their own solidarity video, which you can find on YouTube. Um, this was uh, written, um, videotaped, edited, and posted by them. So what we've learned through the years, as I said, this program is um, 27 years old. Um, I have the honor of being um, there the entire time. Um, I started this program with six students. Uh, now we have you know, over uh, 50 in any given year with about a dozen kids per each um, year, um, cohort year. So 12 eighth graders and so on and so forth. Um, and one of the things, or I should say three of the things that stood out the most um, through these years is that in developing a positive youth-based um, program, youth development-based program, is that it's important to honor the talents and the lived experiences that students bring. Um, we don't need to fix them. They don't need fixing. They need opportunity. And so that's that's what the program should really be focused on. Um, the learning is a two-way street. Uh, the students in the program teach us more than we profess to teach them. We're giving them content, but there is so much learning um, and you know humility that can come from listening to a young person. And Another thing that we learned is that it's super important to kind of co-develop goals and expectations um, for your relationship with each other and for the program content. You know, keep each other accountable as well. And it's important to share the power um, with the students so that your program can be better and for retaining. Because if you don't have authentic opportunities for students to grow and to exercise the skills and the talents that they have, um, they will walk. 
uh, in the time of COVID, um, one of the things that I heard uh, Nilda and Tanisha say this as well, is that you need to, you need to keep it fresh. Um, Zoom fatigue is out there. If you have opportunity to safely go outside and do things, do it. Even if it's in small groups, uh, it's important to do that. And most importantly is creativity. Um, let their creativity loose. There are so many things that we saw our students do in a Zoom-based camp this year with um, yeah, we still did it. We still did it for five weeks. Um, and they just, we gave them the tools and resources that they needed and they blew it up. Uh, what they do really well is to take tough science concepts and turn it into something that's really fun through theater and skits. Um, they use that green screen like I've never seen anybody use. Uh, and if, if you can give them the tools and the latitude, they will, they will bring their A game all the time. Um, so as I said, the Trailblazers program is something that is uh, critical there. The Trailblazers are the teens that are involved in RiverQuest. And that RiverQuest program is about trail experiences on land and in the water. So this, these students are, as part of their training, um, learning about concepts from water quality to watersheds um, to the different kinds of animals and biodiversity to conservation and stewardship. Um, that's something that's all in their in their realm and they take that that information um, and those tools out into the community and they teach the community whether it be you know uh, history or conservation or just recreating and and just loving nature and just listening and and being one with nature. So part of what they do is community kayaking, which we have done in the summer. We try to do two or three of them um, a month just to get people out on the water. Uh, all of these programs, including the cause program, uh, are completely um, at no cost to the students and to the community. And we spend a lot of time raising funds to make sure that uh, we, can, we can do all of this work and that the students are paid. Um, so another program that we're doing that's kind of outside of cause is Discover the Delaware. It's a youth engagement program and it actually spans from Camden to Philadelphia and it's situated in the sixth and eighth grades. And this program combines in-class lessons uh, in partnership with teachers um, with stewardship projects. They could be anything from building an osprey nest to planting a native, uh, a native um, plant garden or pollinator garden um, to looking at careers in environmental science and then taking students out in, in kayaks um, as sort of a culminating experience. Okay, um, I'll skip over this for a second. Um, if anyone needs to get in touch with me after the fact, this is my information and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. All right, great. Thanks so much, Angela, for sharing information about those programs and thanks for sharing that really powerful video on the students sharing their experiences and having their voices heard. That was really great. Um, we do have just a minute if any other questions want to come in for Angela and her presentation. Um, so let's take a look at the Q&A box. If we don't get anything come in, you can feel free to email Angela. All right, with that, we're just gonna move on to wrap up so that we get, make sure that we end today right at one o'clock. So let's just share my screen real quick. All right, so we do have one more webinar coming up in this series, Connecting Youth to Urban Waterways. And this will be the third and final webinar in this series. And we'll have um, speakers from the Alliance for Watershed Education of the Delaware River to talk about their fellow program, as well as a presentation from the Delaware Museum of Natural History on Tuesday, November 17th. 
um, from noon to 1 p.m. And we can add the registration link to the chat. And thanks again for everyone, to everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, and definitely a big thank you to our fantastic speakers today. We will be sending a follow-up email that includes the webinar recording, um, as well as any important links and resources. And we hope to see you next week in our last webinar in this series. And thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.